just thrown into things anyway. So. Sometimes it's better. Yeah. Sometimes it's better yeah. to just be like. I don't, I really, I don't think these are things that you rehearse for, you know? No, just not like, all. <laughs> it, it's not even as good if you do, is the know. thing. Yeah. Because yeah. it's like, we're just talking. Just talking. And just talking. And talk to. Oh, thanks. I feel the same about you. It's really great. Our yeah. conversation is going to go wherever it wants to go. And I'm That's so right. into that. That is right. Right. Oh, I'm so excited. So many questions. Yeah. This is great. And hopefully this starts up with no trouble. Let's see. Perfect. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. All right. Family pictures behind you, family and friends. They're family and friends. Uh, it was always something that my parents had, like a picture wall in their house. And so I think it just, I took that over in my mind to be like, that's what home means is you have like a whole wall of <laughs> pictures of everybody, right? Yeah, so cute. I love how you do that. Thanks. Yeah. And it's nice too, because I don't even, oh, we're live. Everyone's going to know my secrets now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't nice. even like uh, talk to life. all of the Everyone's people whose secrets. pictures are on the wall all that often, but just knowing that they're there and like remembering what they mean to me on, on a sort of daily basis. It's just, I don't know. That's what home's about. <laughs> Right, that's so important. I have the family pictures, family and friends around. Yes, I love all your pictures. We're going to talk about all your pictures. So we can <laughs> jump right in and I will welcome everyone this week to So Ask Us. I am beyond excited to have Anika Lopes with us. We are going to talk about all the things. All the things. Anika is an Amherst resident. She is a Milner, which is just, I think, one of the coolest professions you can possibly have. And we'll talk about what that is if you're not sure. So Anika, thanks for joining me this week. Thank you for having me. Oh my God, yes. Are you kidding? <laughs> I've been waiting and waiting ever since we <laughs> planned this, just, like, <laughs> oh, just to dive in. So I always find that I skip in too fast because I know someone already and I forget to kind of bring the audience along. So we'll just start at the beginning with who are you and how did you come to be in Amherst at this point? Okay. <laughs> I know so, that's a hello, lot. It's like, hello <laughs> everyone, I'm Anika Lopes. Um, I came to be here with you, my family, I'm from here. I grew up here through uh, my early teenage years. And I moved away to Boston and then New York. Um, I have been away for decades living life and, <laughs> and doing you know, all the things. Um, but for probably the last five to six years, um, even though you know, New York has been my home, I lived there longer than anywhere I have. Wow. Um, I'm really inspired by travel. And for the longest time, I've wanted to move my base and mm. you know, be able to explore and do more. And, you know, I've always thought, even though as a kid, I could not wait to move out of Amherst. <laughs> like, I, I was very really excited <laughs> about that. As, you know, an adult, it was always one of those places like, well, you know, where else in the U.S. might I be based? So yeah. um, I've always, you know, kind of had that nostalgia fantasy around that. And, you know, and it just so happened, um, you know, my mom who was with me in New York uh, due to an, an injury that resulted in like an, on, you know, ongoing recovery, mm. that plan was, you know, sped up ahead of time. And, you know, we came here, um, yeah. you know, and yeah, so that's how I ended up back here. It's wild, right? And I feel you and I have been talking recently how this is kind of very of the moment that a lot of people seem to be kind of returning to Amherst or to Northampton, to the Valley. Do you feel like it was always something you knew you were going to do, come back? Or was it something that you sort of fantasized about and thought about, but maybe didn't really think it would happen? <sighs> A little of 
both. You know, yeah. there were there were times that I was like, oh, this is such, you know, a, a fantasy, like especially in times when I would be on the subway in the city and I'm like, that's I just can't wait. You know, I just I, <laughs> I'm leaving tomorrow. I, I, I need to get back like, today, you know, especially when you know those like long waits and you're stuck on the subway. I'm like, I'm I'm leaving today. But, you know, I had always like when I would you know, travel, which I love to do, and I would I would be in places where I was surrounded around nature and just like reminded mm -hmm. me of my roots I just have I've always been drawn to that yeah um and and just feeling like I would love to you know just have more of that in my life you know take take that for granted and so it had been my work for the last maybe five years to figure out how how do I do that so I can have the best of both worlds you know I can still spend time I hope the blue jays aren't too loud <laughs> Yeah, they started up again, right? Yeah. One of the perks of being here, one of the many perks. So, you know, it was nice to just be able to figure out how do I make them work? Like I've, I've never really put myself in a place where I have to be limited. So I just always felt it would, it would naturally happen, you know, yeah. where I would be able to have both. Of course, you know, 2020 uh, changed that like yeah. a little bit, but um, yeah. Yeah. And it's, I feel like more and more people are working remotely, are living in places and then either telecommuting or going in a couple times a week. How has it been to work remotely? And we're going to get into what the work is in a minute, but how has it been to be here physically and still have that sort of professional connectivity to New York? Has it been easy? Has it felt like, oh, no problem? I think more and more people are wondering is this something I could do with my profession? I think that, you know, it's an individual journey. I know for myself, I felt in the beginning, I really felt like a deer in headlights. Like, what mm -hmm. am I going to do? Because right. so much of, of what I do was dependent on even being here, being able to be in the city, being able to go and see things in person, see people in, in person. Yeah. Um, you know, there was, there's so much of an aspect of, of laying, you know, hands. Like my, the other part of myself, which is around, you know, development and advancement of people and places that it's been a little easier, you know, because yeah. that, that transitions remotely in a more friendly way. Um, but, you know, for a while, especially when, you know, 2020 really shut us down and all its um, brute glory, I guess we could say. You know, it's, <laughs> I like that. Yeah. It was, um, it was, it was quite a challenge, you know, yeah. um, even, even being here and, you know, just witnessing because, you know, we all saw, um, you know, in terms of the pandemic, uh, we saw that really kind of center and, and come in and, and hit in New York. So, you know, oh, even nice. just seeing, you know, friends and, and places, um, you know, just, just shut down and people suffering, losing, you know, jobs were going by, businesses were closing down. People were just, you know, really displaced. So watching that from afar mm -hmm. was both uh, surreal, um, and it, but it also gave me an opportunity to focus on what I'm grateful for, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because, you know, there were so many people that, you know, what, what, what could they do? You know, yeah. they were stuck essentially. Right. Right. Absolutely. Well, I'm grateful that you were here when this happened, because I can imagine being in New York was would not have felt good at the time. So let's jump into I'm really excited to talk about this because I just think hats are wonderful. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, what is a Milner? What do you do? What is sort of the shape of your professional life? So um, Milner, Millery has pretty much been, the, the definitions have kind of merged. Um, traditionally, you have a, like a milliner is an art of both the design and manufacture of hat making. Uh, but now it's, it's the, the term is used loosely, but yes, it is set, it's, a, it's hat making, um, essentially. Mm -hmm. So how did this art form find you? Because I feel like it's very niche, but then also it is a really important art form, it feels to me, and I, you could probably speak to this much more, in the Black community. It is something that, that has very, very deep roots and deep meaning. So how did you come to start doing it? Was it sort of by chance? Or you just 
fell into it or was it something that early on you really felt connected to? At, this was absolutely by chance. <laughs> um, the best things yeah, are, aren't they? <laughs> it's really, it's really, yeah, it's, um, it was, it's definitely been one of the best and unexpected experiences of my life. Um, so as an undergrad, I was at the New School, I was at Eugene Lang and Parsons, and one of my good friends at Parsons had this internship and, and she, you know, came to me and she's like this internship is not for me. I cannot <laughs> deal with this designer. I just, I can't do it, but I know you can. I just feel like you would connect. And she was right. Oh. Uh, you know, she was absolutely right. And so during uh, this experience, I had to go and pick up these hat forms in the, the garment district and, and the like original, which was the millinery district, which you, it's lost now. I mean, you can see yeah. of it. there is like a, an awesome uh, millinery synagogue that's right there at 38th and, and oh, 6th wow. Avenue, which still stands. But at that time, you could still really feel that old world and what was going on. Mm. So long story short, I go to, you know, one of the old buildings with one of those elevators that take like 30 seconds to get to each floor. <laughs> and I get to this one door, this red door, I'll never forget it which had no sign, nothing. And I, I'm knocking at the door, ringing the bell. And I hear this loud, like, who is it? You know? And, you know, <laughs> I, I said who I was and the, the door opens and there is Mr. Horace, who was the, the first black man to have a factory, hat making factory in the millinery district of the wow. fashion industry of New York. And he was there with his head bleeding I found out he was, he had just been mugged or, you know, some, something. Oh my time. God. So I'm like, oh, we, you know, we have to take care of you. Let's help you go sit down. So I, I called up the designer I was interning for, who was very much like, okay, you know, I'm glad you're concerned, but let's just get the product and move on. Oh, so that's oh. Happen. you know, we stay, I stayed there. I took care of him, but once I walked in, I was just blown away. Like I felt like I had walked back in time and I, and I had, yeah. it was this like over 2000 square foot space where, I mean, it just looked like, I mean, it had been there since I think it was like the early twenties. It used to be oh, um, so cool. Peter and Irving. That was the like, original name. And uh, Mr. Horace had come originally from Mississippi as I think in his late teens and he worked with Peter and Irving and he worked with them for decades and oh. he eventually took over. And, you know, at this point, I believe he was in his eighties and he was just kind of hanging on because it was so important to him that he kept this factory within black ownership. So yeah. it was definitely like the universe had, had put us together. Wow. You know, at this time, of course, meeting him, I had no idea that eventually this would be my showroom or it would, you know, uh, we would modernize it to an extent. Right. Uh, but I was just absolutely fascinated by him, by these forms, by the history. I walked in and there was uh, Bill Cunningham there with him, who was like a you know, famous photographer from like the style section of the New York Times. And it was just, I'm watching them interact. And yeah. it was just amazing. And I, I fell in love with these forms. Um, you know, in my early years, I loved sculpture. So it was like, mm. I was able to relate to that. And um, just through continuing that relationship with him and Mr. Horace seeing the work that I was doing, he would he was famous for saying like, they haven't done that since the year one. And so <laughs> he, would, he would see how I was sewing and making things. And so he started encouraging me, like, if you're gonna do this, like you need to do this for yourself, you know? Yeah. Like if you're gonna just do like, you know, general blocking your intern, but like you're, you're basically doing too much for this internship, you should be doing this, you know, um, on your own. And so long story short, after I graduated, I went on to work uh, with Parsons and I was working with Tim, Tim Gunn at the time. And that was just, this was pre uh, Project Runway. Right. Uh, so it was like, but that was still a whole other wonderful experience. And, but during this time, Soon in, it just so happened that I had the opportunity to come in and and take over Peter and Irving, which oh. was that showroom, and I just felt like, you know, 
when when does this happen? Like I, I have to go. <laughs> this is this is the the time for it. So yeah. Um, yeah, that that's that's how that happened. I went in, finished apprenticing with Mr. Horace. Um, and the, the plan was he was to be with us for you know quite some time and to, to bring in others to be able to really retain his training, um, mm -hmm. his legacy, and celebrate that. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, he became ill soon after, mm -hmm. um, and that really just threw me into okay, you know, here I am uh, with this factory with all of this history and then there, there's me am i ready for this you know right. does that happen but uh, you know we went on to you know figure it out yeah and um you know to this day it's just been one of the most amazing experiences of my life that is so incredible like these moments like this <laughs> where I mean, anyone who knows me, I don't think, I don't feel like I've been too new agey on this program, but anyone who knows me knows that this about me, those moments when the universe is just like, this is what's happening. And I'm just going to put you into this. And like, when you talk about that feeling of, or that questioning of readiness, like over time, or maybe it happened quickly, how did you start to just sort of get into a space of like, I am ready for this. I'm this moment happened because it was meant to happen or did it take years for you to feel that way? Was it a quick process that you were like, all right, here we go. Oh, it, it took time. Uh, there yeah. was a lot going on in this space and it was like, I feel like, well, what do I do? To some extent we had to move on with the times because this space right. was geared towards you know, when people were manufacturing in the, in the U.S., you know, you had, you know, in, Mr., in the day of Mr. Horace and Peter and Irving, like, this is just where people came to either right. you know, designers using those blocks or just when, you know, cleaning and blocking of hats was so popular, you know, yes. people who would just, you know, have their hats and bring them off. And that, it seemed at the time, I thought that was so simple, but that itself is like making a new hat to do it properly yeah so that that business especially like the cleaning and blocking and the refurbishing that mr horace had like a cult following with that <laughs> and you know so and a lot of these, these people that did this they were you know older uh, you know very serious about their hats these you know yeah. some of these hats they'd had forever so when they would uh come in and see myself and the interns that were there with me that we were pretty much peers. They're like, who here possibly knows what they're doing, or <laughs> what they're talking about? So how I learned was the time I, I just, you know, cherished every moment with Mr. Horace. Mm. And so how I started was I was I would do, do that and I would have them off to the customers as if Mr. Horace had done them. Wow. And so after a while, I, I probably waited a good year for people to be like, oh, he's not here. Well, I'll just I'll just leave it here. Please do not have anyone else touch the hat besides Mr. Horace. I probably waited a good year before I let them know that like we were actually doing it, you know, to really wow. make sure that we were able to to build that trust. And, yes. And, you know, and especially like earn that referral system. Yeah, yeah. It's wonderful that you were able to bring that kind of like patience and humility to it. I feel like that's something that can be hard for people who want to be sort of immediately credited for their work. You really were able to step back and, and build the trust with people through that. That's so interesting. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad that I, I learned that then because yeah. just the whole industry around it is very kind of like self-absorbed me, 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 and in a sense, like even if that's not who you are as a person, like the yeah. of fashion and the, um, the entertainment industry, it is a lot of focus on like what you're doing and uh, right. you're as hot as your last collection <laughs> and this one. So it's like, you know, there is a lot of um, that pressure to be me, me, me. And so I'm just thankful that I had that uh, balance, you know, with the other part of, of my life that is really about development and, and advancement of people. And um, I had to apply that to myself, you know, and how I related as somebody who was kind of, in a sense, 
even though I was grateful, thrown into a, a new business that I thought I was starting to, to learn and, and apprentice for a few years before it was just me. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and also having, you know, interns around who were also brilliant and eager to do all the things. So that, that balance of being like, uh, okay, there's quality control. So I, <laughs> I'm not trying to stifle you, but at right. the end of the day, uh, you know, as, as we move forward and you have buyers come in, they have their head, they're looking inside of your product. They're yeah. looking at stitches. So it's like, you know, I had to apply that same balance uh, to others as myself to just, you know, remain the grasshopper, you know. <laughs> That's a good, I like that way of saying it. So for anyone who doesn't know, can you show us one of the hat forms that are behind you and maybe talk us through a little bit of how you would use it? Because anyone watching, I'm sure, is looking at those being like, what are those? So this is probably one of my favorite babies. Can you see it? Yes. Yep. Okay. So, oh my so this gosh. is a cloche. So this is from the early nights, that's probably the early 20s. Ugh. And this I probably still use every season. It's, I mean, it's, it's popular for everyone. It's super popular in Japan. Yeah. Um, but they're 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 ancient. I don't know if you can <gasps> see this. There's like, can you see like this? Oh yeah. Can you see this? Unreal. So they they um, you know, they can come apart. I can kind of mix and match them. Oh, wow. There's one over here. Yeah, let me see. Wow. Yeah, so this one, I believe this one is from France. Oh, my The God. collection that I have, um, it's, it's one from one of the oldest in the States, but, um, you know, one of, one of the oldest, and so these are all of the ones that were owned by Peter and Irving and then Mr. Horace. Uh, there's so many of them, more than I represented here, but this <laughs> is like my kind of like private, uh, most cherished uh, part of the collection here. That is so, so it's so wild. And I, I don't know if I had just never thought about how hats were made, especially felt hats, because I love that shape and a cloche hat. If anyone has trouble visualizing this, go watch Downton Abbey, because the hats <laughs> in that show, I think are really good examples. Um, yeah. But when you, you, you mentioned very quickly when you were working, um, I think after Mr. Horace passed, you said, I modernized a little bit. Like, how do you, especially in a field like hat making, how do you kind of weave in and out of new fashion, you know, callbacks to the classics? How do you move between modernization and keeping something kind of at its roots? Hmm. part of it was a, a big challenge some of this was easy I mean as as I said this was a space where when the elevator finally made it to the floor <laughs> there, was, there was no sign so there were you know little things like a website you know um the the first half of the space we created a showroom so yeah. as opposed to that had a lot to do with turning on the lights you know and just making it a welcoming space where people who were coming in who like um stylists and, mm. and editors and people who were looking for you know a collection that was now that they could use this is where they could go uh, people who were interested in the history and looking at the blocks for themselves to create their own collections and pieces, yeah. they would come into the back, which we left as was, down to, oh, wow. Mr. Morris had a little dial table. It was like a mix of like, you walked into an old factory, there was a little Sanford Sun going on. <laughs> you know, I kept the chairs for Mr. Horace and his oh. friends so they could, you know, still sit there. I mean, they were such, they were part of the essence, you know, right. they were like the, the pulse of that space. Mm. And, you know, really wanted to have to Mr. Horace, like in his later years when he was sick, could just be that person to sit and have people come and interview him and, and ask yeah. his, his opinion and, and really celebrate him. So oh, that's so wonderful. Like I love the idea of front, just like, old back. 
you know, you yes. came, you came <laughs> into the present and then you walked back into the future. I mean, into the past rather when you went back. Oh, that's so wonderful. I think it's important sometimes not to change too much. And when you're talking about this, it, it makes me think kind of of the roots of, uh, of placemaking, which I think about obviously every day um, and the weaving that happens and has to happen and, and respecting the past, not living in it. I mean, we talk about that so much when it comes to a sense of place. Yes. I just, oh man, I can imagine it. I can imagine walking into that space. Yes, How is it for you now not having, or do you still have a physical space in New York that you work out of or are you totally remote at this point? I have a small space where I keep some blocks there, but I really, I haven't been there. I have really centralized myself here yeah. Um, to be, you know, doing my work here, which, you yeah. know, just, you know, certain projects are just starting to kind of come around, at least the ones that, uh, you know, I'm involved in. Yeah. Uh, at, you know, at first, of course, it was completely, it was necessary for me to keep a small space, that, you know, which is in Brooklyn, just to, to still be able to have those relationships and, and right. that's, you know, where I'm based, um, you know, through this work, yeah. but throughout, you know, 2020, it's just really changed that whole landscape where mm -hmm. it hasn't been as, as important, which I'm, you know, pleasantly surprised about. And I'm, I'm happy that, you know, we're finding a way, I think, especially as have artists have to really just reinvent themselves and redefine um, what you're doing and, and how you do it. How do you connect? Um, with community, but it's also yeah. in a great way, it's allowed me to kind of broaden, broaden my base. Like I never would have imagined really having, um, reaching out to a base from here in Amherst, Massachusetts, yeah. you know? Um, but, but it's, I feel like it's full circle because there's so much history involved in what's going on with millinery. And then my history is here. So it's, it's also yeah. really nice to connect the two and, you know, share that, history with this community. Yes, absolutely. I have so many questions about the history, <laughs> um, but I do have some questions coming through about the kind of physical making of the hats. Um, are all of the hats handmade, hand sewn? Is there gluing involved? And can you show us any that you've made? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes to all of it. Yes to all of it except the glue. Uh, <laughs> No glue. Everything that, that I make well, I, from my custom collections, they're all completely done by hand. They're, they're sewn by hand. There's, yes, there's, there's no glue. And uh, yeah, so let's. Oh, this is so exciting. I have had the good fortune to see some of these hats. And so, oh. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. There's so many of them here. Let's see. <laughs> you pulled this over to me. <laughs> and we had another question come through about open studio. While you're showing this, I do want to share, and we're going to get into talking about this a little bit, um, but Anika and I are planning some uh, shows in the Mill District this summer that people can come and see some of her hats, some of the hat forms. We haven't even really talked about everything that, that would be available to be seen. So I will answer that question. Yes, open studio-ish <laughs> on its way, which is very exciting. I don't know if you have other open studios that you do either out of your house or, or out of a space. Have you ever shown in, in a gallery here? No, no, not in, uh, not in, not in Amherst. I, you know, <laughs> coming here, I just, you know, I, I, I have to set up my surroundings in ways that make me happy and inspire me. So I had to have yeah. all of this here. But when I first, you know, set up the, you know, the space that is behind me, um, it, it was, it was really for myself. Of course, you know, you put the intention out there. It's here to be able to share. Um, but, you know, it's just been lately through, you know, meeting like some other like creatives that have really just inspired me, you know, that yes. I've been, you know, thinking more about, uh, you know, opening up within, within Amherst and, you know, sharing this work. So. 
Ah, oh, it's so, so cool. So can you show us a hat and maybe, I know it's a little hard to see on Zoom, but maybe talk through the process of it for folks who are trying to kind of visualize it. Yes, let me just grab something now. Thank you. This is so exciting. These are great questions. Thanks, mom. <laughs> so since we were talking about, uh, let's see, since we're talking about uh, koshas. Yeah. Uh, I'll say this. So here we go. Oh my gosh. This, this is, is probably so cool. one of the most famous, like very Coco Chanel Kush, like a flapper Kush. So yes. I don't know if you all can see this. Okay. I definitely so, can. Yeah. Just the block. And then. Wow. So here you see it. Oh, oh my God. So here you see it. So this is a, a mold brush. I don't know. Yeah. If you can see inside, you know, you have yes, yeah. and oh. this one has like some, some feather details. So this is probably like one of the most used close spot blocks. This has been used for wow. everyone. Have some notorieties, like this is a, a special one. This one during um, Peter and Irving. So I don't know which tour it was, but it had to be like, and maybe around like whichever was like 2004-ish maybe or something that this little teen beret, I don't know if you could see it, but this was actually used for one of Madonna's tours. Oh my gosh. Yeah, but she, uh, had, she had red, I believe that she had red and then everyone else had black or maybe it was the other way around. Oh, wow. You know, such a small crew they had, I don't know, they must've like got rid of them every single show because <laughs> they had it they used a, a new beret for each show oh my goodness that's so unusual yeah. <laughs> so I'm trying to keep up with all the comments there are a lot of wonderful comments coming through um so Diana from our office at Coles says being a horse person I could see some of my people that drive horses wanting her information so you're gonna have some fashion hats for horse shows which I, Diana I so agree I could absolutely see that <laughs> and I that's I think that brings up an interesting question too I mean you mentioned Madonna and folks definitely go to Anika's website and look at some of her work because it's just unreal and oh, yeah. when you're moving between you know a hat that is for a performance piece a hat that is for bridal I mean people are putting you mentioned when you were talking about interns reminding them that like someone's head is going to be physically in this I mean it's going to be part of their identity for the time that they're wearing it does the process change for you depending on what the hat is going to be used for or is your process the same in the making of something whether it's for performance or personal or the most important day of someone's life does it shift your process with it absolutely um especially you know you i may have people that you know come and say you know i'm not a hat person at all you know <laughs> and that's always like the biggest challenge because i'm always yeah. i'm looking at someone i'm like your face is round or oval of the shape of your head and I and I'm just like okay it probably doesn't work for you because you have a fedora and I could stick my fingers up here and it doesn't fit you know right maybe the brim isn't uh, broken down on the correct side or not correct side but correct for your face you know um so I feel like you know there's always something for someone um yeah. bridal uh, is definitely very uh, a personal experience you know yes um, i i have been fortunate i were I've, I've had very few bridezillas i mean not knock on wood but you know that happens <laughs> something i mean that is such a personal experience for yeah. people and i think it's so important to get in touch with the person and you know who who are you yeah and, because you know we live in a, you know in a world for fashion it's mainly like most people are buying something off the rack and it's done and, right. and there you go and so yes there are collections that i do that i'm thinking about maybe what's inspiring me for the moment you know mm -hmm. for the season. and you know but i'm always taking into account what's going on in the world yeah. i have a, a tendency to i like to put things together like i'm I'm, I'm intentional to a great extent with design. So I like to use 
uh, put together fabrics and pieces that are from all around the world and mm. like you know merge things put put things together yeah um when i'm making something for someone specifically i'm thinking about that person so i feel like um it is a connected ex experience like i'm taking into account who are they um yeah. i love it when someone just trusts me to say okay i want you to do what works well but i also love like collaborating uh with people you know whether yeah. it's something that they want to bring to life for themselves or um whether it is a, a whole collection, you know, yeah. with other people, which I love to do. So, uh, I just love that. I mean, I really, there's such an interesting difference, not good or bad for anyone watching who is an artist, such an interesting difference between wearable art, something that someone's sort of carrying on their body and having as part of their identity for a time, and art that we're enjoying, you know to two-dimensional art even performance art there's sort of a, a separation from which we're able to kind of sit back and absorb it as opposed to like yes I want to put this coat on or this hat on mm -hmm. and as we get closer to opening this local artist gallery in the mill district and thinking about who's going to come hopefully out of the woodwork in droves to to have their their art there do you feel you know if you were to do a show of your hats, what feels different between that and say a fashion show where the hats are in motion, they're on someone's body. Do you think that difference between wearable art and sort of, I hate the word static, I don't wanna insult anyone, but static art that someone's kind of consuming at arm's length, is it important to you to sort of see the hats in motion when it comes to the idea of showing them? Not necessarily because I am accustomed to having, you know, whether it's buyers or stylists come mm. and look at pieces. Right. So I feel like, you know, your intention, the work that you're doing, you know, if it, it can speak for itself, you know, yeah. um, but then, then you have, you know, there's a whole other vibe when you're talking about like a show and things are moving and it's on a person and there's now you're talking about the personalities and yeah. are bringing that work to life, you know, so right. it, it is different, but I always feel like, you know, you, sh you need to have your work or at least, you know, my work as well, it can be it is intended to to stand alone. So if, yeah. you know, you, you have to have, you know, set up so people can still go through your your experience and maybe get a sense of what your inspiration was around it and i think that even as we're moving into like this this new world where even when you look at fashion shows in general i mean there's just so many ways that people are are doing things i mean and yeah. and I, there's definitely an exhibit feel to it hmm. sometimes the pieces are there you know, yeah. so they're, they're on, on mannequins or just in, in spaces that you wouldn't imagine. I've even seen some where you, I've seen the garments and it's just as if like the somehow, and I used to do animation and it blows my mind, like the, the person <laughs> is not there, but you're seeing the garment moving as if, you know, it is walking down yeah. the runway. So you're really just seeing the piece. Yeah. And I just feel like now there's, you know, people have and so anyway, because they've had to like, how do how do you make this work when people cannot gather to see, you know, collections the way right. that we're used to, you know? Right. Absolutely. And do you feel like hats are sort of making a comeback? I feel like I see hats more now. And I don't know if it's that I just I'm noticing it more or I have, you know, friends sort of in the fashion field and so I'm more aware of it. Do you feel like hats are coming back or do you feel like they've always been here? And it might depend a little bit on the communities that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I think even with being in New York, it goes in waves. You know, there are some, there have been some years where they're hot and then some years where it's like, yeah, you know, right. <laughs> you know, wearing them. I mean, they might be, you know, more accessories, but I think yeah. there has been like a solid climb in just like the last few years where like because I'm always like once you see something in middle America, then you know, you know, <laughs> so it's, true. It's everywhere, you know, so when something is like 
you know, climbing, you know, for a steady few years and it's, it's went to, to middle America or when you, you know, other indicators, when you start to see like more of the, the fast fashion, right. um, you know, when you just start to see like, okay, you can go in, uh, gosh, you know, off the top of my head. I mean, it could be any, any place like even if it, if it's an H and M, like the true. Yeah, that's exactly where I was fashion, thinking. <laughs> right? and so when you can see like or fedora in any color, you know that you want. Yes. You start seeing those styles, like that's that's when you know, like okay. Yes. Yeah. They'll be huge. And, and even I think it's reflective when you look at, you know, a lot of the collections that have just gone from like the, the past, whether it's been New York Fashion Week and Paris Fashion Week, mm. they're deep. Hats are definitely there, you know. Yes. Thank goodness, because they are just so wonderful. Yeah, and I'm, I think it goes with like the time that we're in as well. You know, it's kind of like, you know, the future is kind of cozy right now with how people mm. are, you know, it's like we we're not necessarily dressing up the way we are so I think right. it's a great time for accessories I mean we could have a fabulous coat and a hat and have our PJs <laughs> under no one, you know no one really knows so I think you know it's all about like the over covering and you know accessories right now yes oh I so agree and I really it's funny because early on in the in the pandemic uh Cinda Jones, who I work for, and you know, who's so fabulous. Yes. Um, she drew this really interesting parallel to the 1920s and the roaring 20s when we came out of the last pandemic that we went through. And just the fashion explosion, I can't help thinking about that very often. So I wonder sometimes if we're about to embark on like a totally new sort of resurgence in fashion just because we'll all be out of our houses again and ready to like throw on some accessories. <laughs> like, oh, I, I, I hope so. And I, I hope so. You know, I'm like, I dress up by myself now. It's just like, because you know, so you have to get it out of your system, yes. you know? Absolutely. I actually had my first like virtual wedding uh, yesterday. Oh my was gosh. So, so amazing. I was like, what, one of my like old assistants who, I do not have kids, but if I did, she'd be my daughter in style and, and heart, you know? Yes. So, and it was just so, so beautiful. And just to be able to walk through them with like, you know, fittings and, and, you know, just see that happen and, and have the time to just really an occasion to, to dress up and yeah. celebrate. And it was also nice to see, though her wedding was uh, socially distanced, it was just nice to see, and, and the wedding was in the city. Mm -hmm. And it was just, you know, nice to see people like in, in spaces that have been closed down yeah. for so long, which were kind of like, you know, old stomping grounds. It was nice to see an event going on there. It was like, you know, seeing that life coming back. Mm. Oh, it's so wonderful. And it's, it's coming back. It is. Sometimes it feels quickly and other times it feels too slow. Do you feel that like push pull of it? I do. You yeah. know, it's something like, I, I think we're, well, at least for myself, like I'm just kind of getting to that place where it's like, I'm planning out, you know, yeah. and actually making plans. So where it's so exciting, there's also that part that's like, oh, do we still need to have that you know, plan B, you know, right. so I, you know, just trying to like, you know, be, go forward with it. I mean, we have to move forward. Um, yes. You know, to an extent, but I, I think that, you know, we're all, or, you know, a lot of us are, are doing what we can to navigate that mm. the best we can. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We're, getting close to time so i will encourage everyone if you have questions please feel free i have so many anika i think you're gonna have to come on again <laughs> um but folks if you're watching please feel free to put a couple more questions up there um and i wanted to ask because i have had the good fortune to talk with you and hear more about your history and your family's history which you are really in touch with we were talking at the beginning about you know pictures in the house to sort of keep relatives and friends very present. And I'm wondering if you would be willing to share with folks watching just a little bit about the kind of history of your family in Amherst. And also I know that members of your family traveled a great deal. And I'm wondering if that maybe, you know, back in the sort of roots of your memory, if that might have impacted or influenced your interest in fashion and presentation. 
Yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, it, it's been nice coming back to Amherst and connecting with family history because I have been, you know, for decades and decades away from that, you yeah. know. Um, and I have a wonderful pod of sisterhood from afar that have come here and enjoyed and fa have fallen in love with Amherst. But <laughs> it's nice. It's like, in a sense, going back, um, it feels like going back in time in a way. Uh, so my great grandfather was born here in Amherst to Gilbert Roberts in 1896. Uh, and his father before him, but he is probably the person that would be the most well-known here in terms of traveling. He was a jazz musician. Mm. Um, you know, he traveled all over the place, all over the, all over. Um, he initially did this to, you know, find, to, to find employment because it wasn't an option for him here. Right. So his, his traveling was necessary, but it definitely inspired my love of traveling. Mm. Um, I also have, uh, I was very fortunate at a young age, my, my aunt, uh, Sharon Bridges Pariser, she grew up in Amherst as well, but she had left early on and she went to Boston and I was fortunate, she's an artist as well. And mm. she's probably one of the originators that saw that within me as a young, as a kid. And so I would spend a lot of time with her, you know, just in Boston, going to the museums and, yeah. you know, just really exploring. She was, you know, she would travel all over as well. Um, so. I definitely feel I've been influenced by my family in that regard. That's so awesome. And it's so wonderful. I mean, I feel like a lot of people don't have that opportunity with family members and even what you just touched on that I think is so beautiful when those who are older in our lives see something in us and nurture it. You know, it's such a gift for someone to identify that spark and then kind of take it to the next level in a way that it sounds like was very much just an offering. She was just kind of offering a door to something, you know, I mean, I don't know, maybe she was pushing you to be an artist as well, but it feels like it was an invitation. Yeah, it absolutely was. I think, you know, she saw it, it was something that maybe, you know, she identified with herself and also, you know, she, she was here. So I think that, you know, she, yeah. did, you know, for myself, like I needed to see the world outside of here. I needed to see myself and others that were mm -hmm. like me and, and be able to expose to areas where, you know, I did see opportunities in a way um, that I didn't see them here. Interesting. Uh, and that, yeah, and I was also, you know, lucky. My my grandfather uh, Dudley Bridges, who um, was like my father, um, my heart here. Uh, you know, he 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 did encourage me in, in the arts. I think he may have preferred mm. to go another direction, but he was still, you know, he <laughs> he accepted me. Um, he's he's one of my biggest motivations um, here at this time, um, mm. and, and also being involved with uh, projects, which, you know, stem to throughout, you know, the shows that we're talking about. Yeah. Um, yes, he had in his time here, actually one of his last projects, his last life work was he wanted the, the Civil War tablets that are here in the town. He had wanted them to be up and, and displayed to celebrate the, the history on there, you know, particularly also the African-American history. Um, he had yeah. we have family members on them but he you know he loved this community he loved Amherst he was a veteran and you know it was really it was it, it's so important to him that you know these tablets were out and created space I mean he had seen um his his children had had all left here his, his grandchildren were not here and I think it was just really important for him that you know as people return they would see a reflection of themselves not just for yeah. his family but for community at large yeah to to see that so it is wonderful it's it's been that was a completely unexpected journey for me as well yeah um, that that's been wonderful so it, it's nice you know we're at a place for you know people who who do not know that uh these plaques are out in the open and you know we're moving full speed ahead to have them as a guest of honor you know for juneteenth and amherst you know yeah yeah, yeah which is so wonderful and i'm I'm keeping an eye on the time and I know we had talked about fitting so many topics into this today, but I'm thinking that, that it would be so wonderful to bring you back on as we get closer to Juneteenth 
and maybe talk more in depth about this. But for folks who don't know, and maybe you just piqued a lot of people's curiosity, what are these Civil War tablets? You know, who's mentioned on them? What is the history that they are related to? Oh, so these were tablets that were gifted to the town uh, eons and, and eons ago. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, uh, they celebrate folks who had fought in the Civil War um, who are from the area. So I believe there's about 300 names. You wow. know, I could, I could only imagine that there are probably connections to so many, you know, families in the area. Uh, so they have been in storage, you know, for, for quite some time, but um, I think just the significance, and I, I've recently learned even with Juneteenth that, which is really special, that, you know, there are, you know, some of us, we hear Juneteenth and we hear it of being, you know, somewhere far away, right. uh, or, you know, Texas, not you know, that far, but mm -hmm. we hear about <laughs> that. far away. You know? <laughs> it, it, it's, it's nice to know that, like, we actually have people who were in Juneteenth and they're yes. right in the West Cemetery. So it's like, there is that mm -hmm. connection, you know, for Amherst, which is, you know, which should definitely be celebrated. And, um, you know, it's just something for everyone here to, to be proud of, you know? Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, I'm so excited to talk more about that. I'm feeling the like push pull right now. I'm like, do we dive in? I feel like if we dive in, we'll be here for another hour. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like holding it back a little bit, but but I I like the idea of, of just sort of um, setting it up for a future conversation. So for folks who might be very curious, um, Anika and I and Jen Moisten from the town and the Shabazz family and so many other people between uh, downtown and the Mill District, we are planning to celebrate Juneteenth, which I, I think I'm right in saying that Juneteenth was the day, I'm not even sure of the year, I guess it would have been like 1865, was the day that um, soldiers made it to Texas to tell people there that um, slavery was over, that they were free. And it was the last place that people needed to be told for the message to kind of be complete. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, so we, I believe, you know, there was four years after the fact. Was it really? Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. So, yes. Wow. And yeah, so you had people that were from the, the 5th Regiment and others that had, you know, made it and, you know, let people know, Gosh. you know, you're, you're free. So it's just wow. amazing. And it's also, you know, it's, it, it's, it's paralleled. <laughs> you know, in, in so yeah. many ways, you know, um, I think just, just in general, people realizing, like, I'm, I'm so inspired by uh, this event and freedom in general. Mm. Uh, I believe that there are just so many ways, even just where we are now, uh, through yeah. 2020, that there are so many people that are relating to that idea, like you're free, you yeah. know, and, and finding that out in, in so many ways. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think especially coming out of COVID, a lot of people have found perhaps a newfound compassion or empathy for feelings of freedom, for feelings of not being kind of constricted and held in or worse abused in awful ways. So I'm, I'm interested to see kind of how we continue to rally around this feeling because when people finally connect with something in their body, sometimes it can really explode what you thought someone else had gone through when you finally feel it. And yes, I think that, you know, we're definitely at a space where, um, you know, we have to depend on each other in so many ways in ways that people hadn't before. Mm. You know, there, there are just so many systems that, that no longer work, um, you know, even if they had been in, in play, like we are right. seeing it's, I mean, if we're not working together, I mean, we're really not going anywhere. And I think it's just that time in all regards, which is something that, you know, has been also, you know, my life's work and what I stand for. It's like, if you right now are, are fortunate enough to have a seat at the table and you are not making room for someone else and it's not your work to bring someone else to the table, like, what are you even doing, you know? Yeah. 
Um, and I just think that that's so important. And we're realizing like how many people have not had a seat at the table, Yeah, you know, and, and how stagnant we are because of that, even if it's systems that we're used to, you know, so, yeah. you know, I'm just I'm really excited about that. I just, I feel like, you know, cheers to new seats and yeah. you know, fresh vision and perspective, you know? Uh, absolutely. Here, here to that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think we've probably built enough curiosity for folks. So I'll just say, Anika, thank you so, so much for this first visit to yes. So Ask Us. It's been thank wonderful to bring our conversation out here. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah. It's great to talk to you. You too. I hope you have a great rest of your day and everyone just stay tuned for more. And we'll see you yes. again. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Bye.